Welcome everyone to Sala Off Script. I'm Leslie Van Duzer from the University of British Columbia School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. I'm pleased to welcome you to our fourth and final conversation in our inaugural series, Falling Cities, curated by Greg Gerard. So welcome back, Greg. Hi, Leslie. Nice to see you again. Likewise. Uh, before I introduce you, I just want to extend our gratitude to the anonymous Sala alumnus who has made this series and so much more possible. I also want to extend thanks to Emma Fennell, Sarah Klim, and Thena Talk for helping bring the Offscript project to fruition. So Vancouver-born photographer Greg Gerard began making photographs as a teenager. By 17, he was checking into cheap downtown hotels to photograph people in pool halls, cafes, and the streets. At 19, he traveled by freighter from San Francisco to Hong Kong, where he stayed for eight months photographing the city. In those early years, Greg also made photographs in Japan, and these vintage images from the 70s and 80s are published in three volumes under Vancouver, Tokyo Yokosuka, and HKPM. At 27, Greg returned to Hong Kong and worked for BBC TV News as a sound recordist in their Asia Bureau for five years, a position that today's guest, Fred Scott, took over when Greg left to take a job as a photographer with Asia Week. Later as a freelance magazine photographer, um, Greg published in Time, Newsweek, National Geographic, Fortune, among other important periodicals. In 1993, he produced his landmark book, City of Darkness, with Ian Lambot, an extensive documentation of Kowloon Walled City. In the late 90s, Greg moved from Hong Kong to Shanghai, where he recorded the rapidly changing city in his book, Phantom Shanghai. And after living for decades in China, Greg returned to Vancouver in 2011, where he is represented by Monte Clark Gallery. So in the past three weeks, Greg and his guests have taken us to Hong Kong, Saigon, and Caracas. Today, Greg and his guest, Fred Scott, will discuss Kabul and other falling cities in the region. So I'd like to now welcome Fred Scott to join us. Hi, Fred. Thank you for joining us from the UK and welcome. <laughs> Before I uh, turn things over to you and Greg, I'd like to introduce you to our audience. Veteran cameraman Fred Scott hails originally from California, where he received a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Cruz. With the intention of becoming a painter, he applied to and was accepted into the MFA program at Berkeley. But instead of continuing on to graduate school, he made a life altering decision to move to Hong Kong to work for BBC TV News as a sound recordist, replacing Greg when he left the position. Fred subsequently transitioned from sound recordist to a sound and cameraman, um, and now has worked for BBC for over 30 years. Fred has been sent to document numerous falling cities from Kabul to Aleppo to Baghdad, often risking his life to bring the news. Fred was one of the first journalists to be embedded with troops in Iraq and was caught up in friendly fire en route to Baghdad. He and journalist Paul Wood received the Frontline Club special commendation for a piece, Holmes' Journey into Hell, the documentation of Syrian civilians fleeing murderous government troops in the ruined city of Holmes. Very few uh, could muster the courage to take on these dangerous uh, assignments, and, but such essential work. Soon Fred will be traveling later this week uh, abroad again to document a very different kind of volatility, the US presidential election. So a final word uh, to the audience before I sign off. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. Uh, Greg and Fred will get to as many of those as possible at the end of the exchange. And um, now over to the two of you. Thank you. Thank you. Fred, thanks for being with us. It's great to have this chance to catch up. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure, Greg. And, and, and 
see some of your early work as well as, as more recent stuff, which I hope we'll have time to get to later. But, um, you know, maybe in your, I mean, Leslie set out what you do and what you've been doing, but um, I mean, maybe in your own words, how, how, do, you, how do you think about what, what you do? I mean, maybe you could just give us a little summary of where you're living and, and what it is you're doing. Um, I guess since, um, you know, kind of during the course of this year and all of the restrictions that we're, that we're all coming to terms with, with, with the pandemic, is that um, I've been on the road um, anywhere from 150 to 200 days a year, almost every year for the last 30 years, and then suddenly nothing. <laughs> and back over it. And, and so much of it was spent in very difficult places. Uh, I was kind of kind of arguing for my job um, a few weeks back and pointing out to them that uh, it, it was rare for me to get an assignment that, that didn't involve me taking a sleeping bag. And, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I started, uh, I started reading um, more of Homer's Iliad and uh, going to a conflict, a war, um, um, a massive civil disruption, a civil war, however, um, kind of the world's violent conflicts get kind of defined and, and subgrouped and, and kind of realized that, that we haven't really, you know, telling a great war story, which, which is probably one of the hardest things to do. I mean, we've been retelling the Iliad for centuries. Uh, it goes on, and just in this one phase, I mean, I, um, I mean, I, I can't count the number of places that I mean, you know, when I first met you, and in Hong Kong, we were on the road constantly. I mean, we didn't really have much of a life. I mean, back then it was two hundred and twenty day contract for on the road, and often exceeding that. Uh, and it was, you know, the Philippines was erupting, Cambodia, Sri Lanka problems everywhere and and that tempo really hasn't reduced at all right i mean one of the big things that's changed is maybe the 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 speed of the appetite for news the 24-hour news cycle that's something that maybe has changed since we both began but um maybe just just to start with you know i i if I may, I'd like to show some pictures from Kabul that kind of predate the clip that we're first gonna watch uh, of uh, you filming in 1996. So I'm just gonna try to share some, um, some pictures here now, if I can. Um, Should we talk over the top of this or? or I think or, we or, can, or, yeah. Or, okay. um, because it might need a little bit of explaining as we go. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll quickly show the Kabul during the Soviet period, because that's what fell, the Taliban took over. And so I just wanted to show some, um, um, Kabul scenes from that period. Oh, so, yeah. so the world's this, a dangerous airplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Afghan Ariana. So in these days, during the Soviet occupation, this is one of the first assignments I did for Asia Week. Um, it was quite rare to get a visa to visit. And so it was something of a coup just to be allowed to go. So I flew from Delhi to Kabul. I expected someone to meet me from the foreign ministry. Nobody was there. So I found a, a taxi into the city and checked in and then sought out uh, somebody from the foreign ministry to kind of, um, you know, deal with me and the, uh, the program for the week I was going to be there. Um, during this period, um, the Mujahideen had sort of more or less encircled Kabul and to fly into the city, you had to kind of corkscrew down from 30,000 feet to avoid the um, uh, stingers portable missiles that were aimed at a lot of things flying in and out of the airport. 
I remember the ears popping. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, the flares. Flares yeah. to kind of deflect um, heat seeking missiles from incoming aircraft. But I mean, Kabul at this period was relatively peaceful. Um, Mujahideen were taking on Afghan uh, Soviet government troops in outlying areas. And you know, my, my big task was really just to show what, what Kabul looked like during this period. So one of the first things I did was try to photograph Russians, um, you know, first from a little bit of a distance and then later up close, and really just to show kind of daily life in the city. Um, they were, you know, stationed here and there uh, within the city. But I mean, Kabul was a relatively cosmopolitan place in a Soviet bloc kind of con context. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Soviets had been there for, for 10 years and the government before that was Moscow looking in terms of um, uh, increasing women's role in society there in the 50s and 60s. Do you remember there was that big portrait of the, um, of the Afghan cosmonaut Painted how was, how was cross, there? Across from the from from kind of the post office because I think I went in around the same time you did, but a bit later with Eric and Brian. Huh. But yeah, it was it was an amazing place. That's right. No, it was it was mm -hmm. really um, you know quite uh, quite a lot more sophisticated. Let me put it that way than I expected. So I was staying at the Kabul hotel and came back from shooting one afternoon and uh, there was a wedding going on in the banquet room. So, um, you know, in those days I would make photographs of like everything, anything to show what was going on in a place. So there was, there really wasn't some like downtime in the sense I wasn't covering a conflict for this story. It was really anything and everything that was going on in, in Kabul. So the more face and body covering um, uh, clothing, that was evident there too at the time, but mostly it was from people from villages who were coming into the city rather than Kabul um, residents themselves. Yeah, well, the village took over. Yeah. So I think this is on the east side of town on the, the road to Jalalabad. So first thing, maybe you can set this up for us. So it's 1996 now. Yeah. And you've put this clip together for us. Um, there's no correspondent voiceover. So we're looking at some footage that you, you've um, edited together for us. Can you like give us a little? Um, can yeah. you give us a little indication of like the the prelude to this? So yeah, I mean, while why I was in the country in the first place was was um, to do um, uh, an economic story, a business story uh, in Jalalabad, which is which is the first big city after the after the Khyber Pass when you cross from Pakistan. Um, through the Hindu Kush and into into Afghanistan itself to to kind of do a story about what it's like, you know, as a businessman, as a trader under the Taliban, and you know, the Taliban can be very very difficult certainly, but they 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 were also fairly accommodating. And we were with our brilliant fixer and journalist from Pakistan, Rahimullah Yusufzai, and in the course of a day, we were invited over to. Um, uh, a big meeting place near the Spingar Hotel. And uh, Mullah Burjan, who is the top Taliban commander in, in the east there, had said, uh, you should come with us. We're taking Kabul tomorrow. So, so you get this invitation. Yeah, we were, we were, we were, yeah, we were, we were there doing a story about, about the price of bananas, frankly, <laughs> and, 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 and the same, and it was, it was, it was hard to credit or to take seriously, except that this man was basically, he wasn't, he wasn't one of the kind of really hardcore Kandahari types in the first place. He, he, I think he was a, he was an officer in the, in Najibullah's um, national army before changing right. sides. 
excuse me for interrupting, Fred, I'm just going to roll the footage and you can okay, kind of yeah. talk over us yeah. and, and, and tell us what's happening. So you're, you're, yeah. you're so basically we set off, we set off in the dark, um, probably, probably two hours behind the main spearhead of the Taliban attack. They would, they would, um, pass through the silt gorge and they, they had some other flanking maneuver. And as the sun started to come up, we were driving through the gorge, literally over thousands of brass shell casings burnt out vehicles. Okay, one second. I'm having problem um, sharing this. One second. Well, well, kind of the first image that will start to come up will be driving into Kabul very, very early in the morning as the city wakes up. We'll give okay. you a moment to uh, find it. Sorry about that interruption. So here we are. Yeah, so this is, this is, this is the capital's um, you know, sort of good morning to the new kind of reality. And this is the full force of the Taliban. Almost all of them country boys from the South, hardened fighters. And so the, the town is just, the city is just watching this happen. People are, are yeah. just watching the, the conquerors roll in. Yeah. And, and, you know, they're, we're getting quite a lot of attention ourselves, and it was it was quite spooky. This is what everyone's looking at: are the hanging bodies of. Yeah, we're uh, seeing some graphic uh, footage coming up. President. So, this is the former know. president and his brother who um, were tortured and hanged. Um, it's it's uh, so a settling of scores. Well, yes, the stuffing of money in the nostrils and cigarettes in fingers is a. Uh, Form of form of insult, uh, audio. But basically, and this is a whole population just wondering what the hell has happened. Yeah, you know, they've heard of these guys. They've seen some of them. They may even be be so related to them. But suddenly, here they are, with their pickup trucks and quivers of rocket propelled grenades. Uh, and so you're you're just picking up what you can as this is going on. You're just sort of moving through the city, yeah. getting out of your car, filming, getting back in. Yeah, this is the this is the presidential palace, which is always going to be a focal point of of a coup or or a kind of military takeover. Um, these are mostly Kabul residents who who are showing support for the new the new regime. Right. Um, you know, this is a very uncertain time. People are 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 really not clear. I mean. Everyone's in instinct is to back the stronger side. And this is the new strong bunch. And indeed they were. Uh, logistically, how to do this was it, was that I filmed whatever I could for about two hours. Correspondent David Loyne then belted um, his voice track into a microphone in the car with the windows rolled up. And then Vlad Lezinski, who was a picture editor, then drove one tape with the track all the way back to Pakistan oh, wow. in time to cut it himself and then drove on to Islamabad to have it transmitted by, by satellite. Probably the single most astonishing journey um, I've heard of. How, how, how long would that journey right be? Back through the war. Oh my God. It was, I mean, it was, I mean, he must have left at about 7.30, 8 in the morning, made it in time to Islamabad for, uh, I think it was a nine o'clock news back then. So you, I mean, here you had a time, time difference advantage, but you know, it's just a believable journey. So these are extraordinary scenes, just kind of riding with the victorious army on the back of their um, battle that wagon. Thing, Greg. That's the thing: is your your odds on on the winning side. Even though they may hate your guts, they're going to be generous because they're pretty excited. Okay, yeah. this next scene is an important part of nation building. This is setting your stamp of what the new rules are going to be. These are the Taliban driving a tank at full hurdle towards alcohol. Now, I was with Tim McGurk, who you kind of remember from, from Time Magazine. Tim, who'd been traveling as a hippie, had said that those 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 brown bottles of Afghan brandy were actually, I mean, 
I shuddered at the thought, but he said they were actually delicious. <laughs> probably worth 50 or 60 bottles. I mean, a kind of dollars at the time. So but anyway, yes, this is the summary execution of, of the so al al alcohol, among many other things, was was banned during the, the, the Taliban regime. And this is like introducing that Yes, straight away, pretty much code. on the first day. It's the new code. It's stamping, um, stamping authority on what was a wow, extraordinary stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, this next scene, this is now. This is two thousand. We're talking five years later. So. A lot has happened during that period. Taliban have come to power. They've created a refuge for Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda launched attacks on the US embassies in Tanzania and Nairobi. Yeah. Clinton targeted Al Qaeda camps in yeah, coast. Yeah. In, in coast. 9-11 yeah. happened. And then the Taliban won't give up Al Qaeda, so the states in Britain decide to invade. Yeah. So this is where we're at now, five years later, after the 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 kind of the the end the end game for the Taliban governing Afghanistan. And can you bring us up to date here with 2001, five years later? Um, yeah. Just just introduce this piece a little bit. This has got a voiceover to it, and we'll talk more afterwards. But maybe you can just introduce this. Yeah. Um, yes, it requires a bit of setting up. What what happened is basically the U.S. is uh, pelting parts of Afghanistan with with uh, with its air force, including B-52s. Um, William Reeve, who's one of the former uh, radio correspondents based in Kabul, um, uh, um, with through his through his contact from the uh, kind of Persian service, um, Ismail Sadat, uh, approached the Taliban, and uh, basically the BBC had a house in the Wazir Akbar Khan neighborhood. Um, we were thrown out of it. Uh, some years before uh, for hostile reporting about the Taliban as they perceived it. They said, well, William, if you want to come back, we will, we will give the house back to you. And he thought, great. Um, so he invited myself and Phil Goodwin and Raghi Omar also joined. We got onto some coaches in um, Peshawar, drove over the Khyber Pass with uh, basically it was two coach loads of what were thought to be largely sympathetic uh, journalists from mainly the Islamic world. So throughout the Gulf, Middle East, Indonesia, the Philippines, North Africa. Drove into Kabul under Taliban control. Sky is filled with the contrails of B-52s. And by contrails, I don't mean straight lines that you normally see across the sky. I mean circles, which will make the hair on your neck stand up. So B-52 um, is bombing. Yeah, you, 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 you don't want to see contrails in a, in a coil over your head. That's, <laughs> that's an alarming thought. So, but yeah, so, so we, were, we were in there for about two weeks until, until, until the Northern Alliance with U.S. assistance um, pushed the Taliban out of Kabul. Okay. So, in our home. so we, we, we saw 1996, the arrival of the Taliban, and basically what we're watching here is their departure, as as you've joined the kind of the the last legs of the the Taliban before before they exactly. they they scoot. Yeah, and some of the desperation in, in the city before it happened. I mean, kind of the image quality over the years has kind of degraded quite a bit, unfortunately. But but you'll still see a sense of what's going on. Okay, so we'll watch this and talk Taliban. more after after yeah. after this. safely in Taliban hands, people continue their daily lives as best they can. The plight of women hasn't changed either. By the Taliban, the American bombing made their situation worse. As these women queued for Western food aid, Taliban discipline was meted out.
This is the World Food Program, food, food and distribution. This is where Najib Bullah had previously been hanging in 96. This location has a grim past. Five years earlier, they hung the body of former communist president Najibullah in the same place. Don't mess with us, the Taliban was saying. But the big test was drawing closer. You see, man, William Reed was broadcasting live to the world. Where a few trucks piled with personal um, possessions going one way or the other. But otherwise, there's not much people can do. The where, where do they go? All they can do is um, stay at home and hope for the best. You've heard before, William, that Taliban fighters have been seen North of the Have you seen evidence of that? Jesus Christ. A large bomb had completely destroyed a house two doors away, where locals said a group of Taliban had been living. All the windows of our house were smashed, doors blown off their hinges. We weren't going to wait around for another attack. This was our mistake. You left a great speed. Should have waited. <laughs> our local fixer, come guard, himself a Talib, set off across Kabul to a hotel where we thought we might be safer. That chaotic night, the Taliban were suddenly giving up the city. Truckloads were quitting the fight. Convoys were in retreat. But in the town centre, at a checkpoint, we were held up. The tension was obvious. Everyone was very jumpy. The Taliban wanted our camera. They took the camera, but they didn't know it was still switched on and recording sound. And as they carried the camera away, they talked about war and defeat. But after what seemed an eternity, they let us go and gave us back our camera. Our local Talib fixer come guard had saved the day. His war was now over. He just wanted to get back to his family, but we were saved. Oh. Um, <laughs> in, incredible, incredible footage and incredible story. Um, you were saying that, um, I mean, just to kind of deconstruct that or un unpack it a little bit, you, you were saying that um, that was your mistake to leave the BBC house uh, when that was going on. T tell us about that. Well, the neighborhood where our house was, um, uh, it was actually the Taliban mayor of Kabul, whose house was across the street, across the lane where the street is too grand, uh, which was flattened. It was pancaked by a, by a laser guided bomb or a precision guided bomb of some sort. Um, blew out part of the front of our house. We were in the back of the house, luckily, and uh, adhesive film was all over the window behind William, who's broadcasting otherwise, God knows what condition he would have been in. Uh, street was filled with smoke and dust. You know, it was a winter's night, you know how that stuff is. And Kathy Gannon, um, brilliant correspondent from, from AP, and Amir Shah, who were just down the road, I think we were amongst the only foreign correspondents there, came over straight away, decided it was best to go across town to the Intercon Hotel, where it would be safer. But we ran into the main retreat of the Taliban who were leaving the Shamali Plain ran smack into them. And worse than that, at that roundabout, uh, the Talibs running that, one of them specifically knew me and knew Phil. Uh, we were standing there in our armored jackets, looking just like this in front of this spectacular retreat of all these guys, I mean, pissed off, spitting on us, shouting insults. And we're standing there and 
Phil and I knew we were going to be executed and just left in, left in the ditch. Um, I'd left the camera rolling, which is, of course they'd taken away. Um, Amir Shah, who is, who is Kathy's right-hand man, had basically come over and, and had done more to um, pitch for our, our survival than anyone. But it was so strange. Basically what he'd said was that I was the son of John Major. Why do why, why the Taliban would know who he was or care it's beyond me, but it worked. Basically, I think part of it was that they were very busy managing a military fiasco. And I mean, look, look, as terrible as these guys could be, there is there is an underlying decency amongst amongst many. They just gave 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 the camera back to us and told us to get lost. Which was incredible. I mean, uh, um, uh, I would have thought they would at least smash the camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, I debated whether it was wise to leave it recording at the time, but they didn't didn't seem to notice one way or the other. But but that could have been bad as well. I mean, that was a very very narrow escape. Yeah, and the that clip ends with you saying basically goodbye to your Talib. It was our fixer? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Maybe you could talk a little bit later. Yeah, because um, <laughs> Ishmael, Ishmael stayed in touch with him. Um, we completely lost touch. He was, he was, I mean, anytime you get a, a government minder or a fixer from the Ministry of Information, you know you're in trouble <laughs> because because it's, you know, it's a ministry with the very least influence or power over anything. Right. Anyway, he was a nice enough guy, basically, and and because in the house we, we um, still had a little dish that was working. We, we tweaked the wires and we were able to watch a bit of TV, which of course was very, very naughty. So we tuned into some Bollywood and he was very happy um, checking out the latest from Bollywood. And uh, I mean, look, he was very, very brave, which, which actually was very brave given how tiny his level of authority was. He argued for us. He tried to save us. When I was with Raggy, who's 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 a Somali, there were so many foreign volunteers fighting alongside the Taliban that Raggy was bailing me out every time oh. as the Caucasian foreigner. The minute this flipped, when the Taliban had left town, I was then saving his neck from 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 furious local Kabulis who who oh. you know. Basically, seeing seeing a North African, you know, these guys were these guys were Taliban. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of the this bubble that you're in when you kind of start a story. There's a certain amount of um, uh, shared. Um, um, you're, you're sharing the situation between other um, BBC people, your fixer, um, you're operating within kind of parameters you understand. And then suddenly, at, or not suddenly, but gradually, in any case, at some point, that bubble breaks and, and you're totally on your own. I mean, that really sounds like what happened here. You know, yeah. all the, the normal protections are gone and it really is just you and maybe a colleague against the crowd. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think, I think if you have any sense of, of, of desperately wanting to impose order in order to stay um, collected and calm, it'll just never work. Um, you really just have to be watching for any opportunity at any time to, to, to try to extricate yourself anything you can see, think of to say, or just shut up, just yeah. not say anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, in times past, I mean, you know, sometimes throwing a tantrum works, some other times that's the last thing to do. Um, yeah. Quiet, respectful, yes. Some swagger, other times. There really isn't, there really isn't much of a playbook on this. It, it's, yeah. I mean, I know it sounds a bit kind of, mindful but, but just being absolutely present which i mean first of all you, you really wouldn't 
if you've got any choice, you would never go into a, a situation like this where you know a city is going to and is likely to fall around you without being with people who really pay attention and don't have their head in the clouds or staring at, well, back then we didn't have them, but staring at their phone the whole time. If you're driving around, windows rolled down, listening outside, you know, some discipline and focus is, is so much of what, what will get you through this. And then, and then of course, most crucially, just having the very best local people working alongside you. They know people that have got great instincts and can, particularly if they've been doing this for a number of years in a very difficult place in which they live, they've beaten the actuarial odds of, of, of tripping up themselves and are, are you know, exceptional operators. It's, it's, it's impossible to overstate the importance of these local contacts and fixers. I mean, they, they are literally lifesavers. Yeah, I mean, Ishmael Sadat, Amir Shah, in this case, just, just fantastic. I mean, these days, um, uh, Mafuz Abedi, uh, just brilliant guys. They, they know our trade often, often better than we do their contacts, but they're also, they're also very much exposed. They're accountable to within their own governmental situation, contacts, trouble with the police, trouble with corruption, trouble with the military, on and on, but also dealing with, um, you know, our own contacts over the years with the Taliban. We've, we've had an open line to them. Uh, but of course, you need to be fairly frank with with the security forces within the bubble you're living at the time about, about these contacts, so, about which of course they know. Right. But, you know, it's a, it's a situation that requires a lot of attention. Um, I, it was interesting watching uh, that, um, that, that sequence where William Reed is broadcasting and he's, I think he's answering questions from Lise Doucette who's on the yeah, other end of the line. Exactly. <laughs> uh, unmistakable voice um, and, and, and a, 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 an, old, an old Afghan hand also. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I mean, he was responding to a question where, uh, we didn't hear the question, but, but he's saying something like, well, people, they, they, they can only do, all they can do is wait and, and see what happens here. And, I, and I, I guess that's in a response to what's the situation in Kabul, but that, that sense of people having, to wait for this to play out, however it's going to play out, that's the situation most people are in, um, yeah. as as an army retreats or, or enters the city. I mean, this this sort of sense of being hunkered down and, and waiting for this to play out, which is something that Kabul has experienced, obviously, uh, a number of times. Well, in two thousand one, I couldn't I couldn't find any of the old packages that we did, but the the morning after, the night before, was pretty dramatic. Um, as you come down the hill off the intercon, I mean, there were, there were a lot of mainly Pakistani Taliban stragglers who missed the last bus out of town. And they were being uh, relentlessly hunted down by citizens. Not many soldiers from the Northern Alliance had entered the city. That was, they were not meant to, but of course they did anyway. Right. Uh, there'd been drone strikes overnight on, uh, straggler vehicles trying to flee uh some of these guys had climbed trees in in the park to tr try and avoid detection yeah. um all of their safe houses because they had dormitories all over the city a treasure trove of documents and and stuff but, but they were all getting run down but of course a lot of organized criminals you know kind of were the first people to come out you know of hiding they they had weapons buried in their back gardens. I mean, there were guys manning checkpoints they'd just thrown up first thing in the morning with, uh, I don't even, you know, if they shot kind of, tried to fire one of these guns, I mean, they were kind of blown up in their faces. But there's actually, there's actually a checkpoint manned by guys with carpenter's tools. <laughs> so I, was, I was threatened by a man waving a rusty saw at me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you know, there was a lot of tension in the in the hours it took for um, American back Northern Alliance troops to arrive in uniform armored vehicles and start to impose some authority. 
And so that, for example, where that clip ends, you're saying goodbye to your fixer. He's going to kind yeah. of retreat with the Taliban. And then what, what do you guys do that night after, after that? Well, um, Phil and I basically got it up into a room as high as we could get. Um, water was only going up to a certain height in the hotel. Is this in the intercom? Uh, anything. Yeah, it was at the intercom. And basically we hunkered down behind quite a thick um, uh, balcony abutment. I mean, it was, was fairly thick. We sat there trying not to be seen. We could see the main road coming off the plane through town and then routes uh, south towards Logar and just a trail of, of headlights and taillights and sun came up. We waited a bit and then and then kind of ventured out into this uh, uh, freakishly quiet, cold, foggy morning. Um, and that's the scary part. You don't know who you're gonna run into because you have to, you have to account that there'll be some desperate people who've missed their ride out. Right, right. Um, and we'll, and, 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 and you're, we'll be wanting you, your car. Are, are you able to file reports from, from there? Uh, well, the stuff that you saw was coming out from a very early form of uh, a store and forward device, like, like a super primitive uh, uh, hard drive capturing material, highly compressed, and then spending a huge amount of time with a satellite, with the mobile right. satellite dish. Right. Um, that was our only way of getting things out at that time. And you had okay. to film things in a very special way, no, no sort of panning or... Gotcha, yeah. Um, you've sent me um, quite a lot of, I mean, material from your recent and, and earlier um, stories that you've covered. And there's so many things we could look at. Um, you were on the um, beginning of the campaign to um, go into Baghdad, I guess that's 2003. You yeah. were uh, with the Kurds <clears throat> and um, you were um, basically targeted by a strike brought in by an American forward air controller who was trying to take out a a tank up the road and the coordinates were mistaken and you and your colleagues were were attacked and um, um, I mean I just want to kind of I guess give people a sense of how how wrong things can can go um, yeah um, yeah it's um Anytime you're advancing along these, you know, kind of over rolling hills and, and empty plains, very straight roads, um, you know, where you can be seen and see for miles on all sides. It's, it's very, uh, it's difficult. We, we, joined, we joined some Kurdish forces who were going to help Americans who were about to be overrun by Iraqi tanks. And, um, uh, happy to go with him. I mean, these were some of the best trained and, and had did, been fighting alongside American special forces for years. Um, many of the Americans spoke Kurdish who were with them. And uh, Fred, sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm just trying to... Uh, are you just trying to cue that up? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it sort of explains itself from here. Yeah. We can't so hear the audio. This is oh, well. on the road to towards Baghdad. Yeah, we've reached a crossroad, but it's identical. Basically, you've been hit by an anti tank weapon. Or 
Um, yeah, unbelievable. Um, unbelievable um, tragedy. Your one of your one of your um, colleagues was was killed in that. Um, and seventeen others. And seventeen others. Um, yeah. um, and that's you know that's one of those things that. Um, uh, John Simpson says in his report, it's it's just one of those things that, that happens during during warfare. Um, but um, I mean, how, you know, how, how did that? I mean, how did that affect you? I mean, on a personal note, I mean, do you do you have long last uh, PSTD? And, you know, how, how does how did that play out in your life? Um. There was certainly quite a lot of reevaluation that went on, but then also I'd been doing this for a, quite a few years before and, and always knew that there would be, there would be consequences that, that something like this would happen. And this, this was a classic, a, a classic tragedy in, in a war fighting situation. Um, at least half of us in the team were certainly aware that this is the sort of risk we were we were going to face was was a was a mistake in in um, from an airstrike. Uh, you know, we'd done everything we could to possibly assist in not being misidentified, but you know, there's so many variables. Uh, yeah. But, um you know, I, you know, in, 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 in terms of what I did, did, did beyond that. Um, I think part of the trap is that you, you develop a level of competence at a certain type of work and you've invested a number of years and perversely part of the value of taking risks like this, trying to tell stories that need to be told the number of times that you fail telling it as well as you think you can tell it kind of propels you on to 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 try again and again and i mean for me it's not an adrenaline thing i mean honestly honestly when i got these things i am petrified <laughs> i'm wide awake i'm petrified i don't like the feeling i don't get a buzz from it um but maybe competence is a form of a form of addiction as well or form of kind of recidivist behavior. I mean, these are these are pejorative terms. There might be some more positives to it, except when you wait to think about some of the consequences that this happens for people around you who care for you. Um, and anyway, it's a rolling, a rolling internal discussion. Yeah, yeah. Um, a question's come in. I'm sorry to hear about your colleagues. Um, you've witnessed terrible things during your work. What is the force that motivates you to keep reporting conflict? You kind of answered well, that in a way, but yeah, yeah. I think um, if, if 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 I have answered, I mean, part of it is 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 just knowing knowing where where you haven't gotten things right or as well told as you as as you know you could have. And some of that is technical with with your photography, or sometimes it's a storytelling, or a whole number of things. I mean, what what you want to do is is get something out that that will that will help the wider public in the world understand the reality of what's going on. It's, but you know, it's it's not like I'm having a raging dose of taking myself too seriously, <laughs> but, but yeah. it, it is, it is something that, that does kind of propel you. Yeah, no, I mean, you get, you get good at something and you're learning and incorporating knowledge uh, into making you better at what you do. And it's a very specialized pursuit um, that there's no real, substitute for except the experience of being there at the time and learning. Um, I think we've got time for one, one, more, um, one more clip. So I'm gonna show um, 
uh, something you did in Aleppo. Um, I guess it's early on during this, uh, the Syrian uh, conflict. Ooh, HD finally. <laughs> Air strikes in Aleppo. The regime's tried everything else. To lose Syria's biggest city. So this goes on all day. There's another bomb. In those parts of the city held by the rebels, civilians are paying the price. A jet's cannon spits fire. Planes return to strafe again and again. Bombs. The pilots make slow, almost leisurely turns. They know the rebels have almost nothing, no ground to air missiles to shoot them down. Everybody's extremely nervous. They're making a late pass over us. It's a nerve shredding experience. Every company does that, and they've had many weeks of this here now. Civil war best describes what's happening in Syria. An airstrike hit this neighborhood a few minutes ago. A woman flees barefoot from her home. My family's dead, she goes. Oh, Bashar, you kid, he shouts at Syria's President Assad. You enemy of God. These were civilians. There were no emergency services to speak of. Neighbours come out to do what they can. Then some good news. Three little girls are pulled alive from the wreckage of the building. It's incredible they survived this. Ten people died here. A three-year-old boy was buried inside. Two girls aged 10 and 12 were killed playing in the street. God is great, rises from the crowd. Then they run. Another plane's coming. Rama is one of the girls we saw rescued. Three family members and two friends were killed in the attack. Her father is still too afraid of the regime to show his face, but he criticises the rebels too. They put an anti-aircraft gun on the next building, he says. I ask the commander to move it, he tells me. The bomb seems to have gone through the building with the gun emplacement. Then it exploded in the family house across the road. A neighbour says that's what happened. But people also accuse the regime of bombing recklessly or of deliberately killing civilians. And the rebels say they have no choice but to fight. Why is the whole world watching and doing nothing, he says. The dead are lying in the streets and burying people in gardens. Why is the world protecting Bashar? Western governments don't want to step into Syria. As Aleppo empties, the turmoil elsewhere in the Middle East makes intervention here less likely still. On the front lines of Aleppo, the struggle often seems hopelessly uneven. But the Free Army's fighters inch forward against the destructive power of artillery and jets. For the time being, at least, Syria's rebels know that here on the ground, they're on their own. Allwood, BBC News, Aleppo. Well, extraordinary, uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, I mean, that, that edit where you went um, to the portrait of the girl was so powerful, just that beautiful still, almost a still image, uh, amazing, uh, amazingly powerful. Um, 
you know, to 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 get into Syria at that time, to get into Aleppo, uh, were you sort of, how did you, you started in Turkey and you... Well, how, how did, um, yeah, uh, we started off, I mean, I, I, I almost cringe now when I think about what I was doing back in those days. We, we, we were uh, going on foot over mountains, crossing the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon into, into homes, prominence when, when we could until that became impossible. Uh, we were kidnapped at one stage, managed to escape, and then shifted to Turkey where we then covered uh, Aleppo from there and, and, and the beginning of that demolition. But, but um, uh, I was only really there for the kind of beginning of, of uh, the destruction of Syria's largest city. But also it, it was a shift from, from the Free Syria Army, which were the in indigenous rebel formations that, that were yeah, you know, if we're thinking of falling cities, it's it's people falling with it. Um, they were so kind, generous, brave, defended us, fed us, smuggled us, put themselves at great risk to 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 help us tell their story. But then, you know, with with no support for them coming from the West as they'd hoped these things cycle down and they start to cannibalize. <clears throat> you know, the, the fight for weapons, ammunition, even food, medicine, uh, corridors to evacuate the wounded, both combatants and non-combatants becomes impossible. And, and this, is where, this is where extremism finally found its, found its roots. Bear in mind, the civil war in Syria had the longest run of um, preventing Al Qaeda style extremism from entering their ranks. Almost a year and a half by, by my kind of reckoning, which, which for me is a world record in terms, of, in terms of any civil war, avoiding the bags of money and arms that come with adopting, a, you know, kind of a foreign, ideology and al-qaeda was a foreign ideology for sunni syrians at the time but then you know kidnapping became a huge uh, a huge money earner not just foreigners journalists aid workers etc but also just lots of middle class or well-to-do syrians were being kidnapped in an industry for a while to 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 make money to fuel their their war I mean, one, one, one thing that strikes me, I mean, talking about these things is how that on the ground experience of doing your job, um, which is so much about logistics, um, you know, you, you end up becoming kind of an expert in a very, you can say a very focused way. I don't say narrow, but in a very focused way, because you and your colleagues, anybody who's sort of in this place at this time becomes hyper aware of all the the forces at work so you 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 learn an incredible amount very quickly that that kind of it's it both it both deals with history um society at large and and of course the changing nature of the 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 conflict on the ground, but just the, the amount of um, expertise that gets condensed into days is uh, is really quite extraordinary. And and then I guess it kind of goes away as you leave and go on to the next thing. But you you kind of, in some sense, I guess you you always go back to what you know about that place when you were there, and you're seeing how things have moved on when you go back. Yeah, I mean things do move on, and and. And your 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 skill set is is perishable, and and you know I've I've not been back to Syria in uh, seven months, and um, I would need to start over, really. Um, you know, certain certain basics stay with you, 
Um, you know, some of it's some of it's just just getting your head right. You know, um, knowing that you're going to sit in an incredibly cramped and crappy vehicle over over, over filthy roads. For, you know, you know, for a nine hour journey with both of your legs asleep. You just need to suck it up and keep thinking about interesting pictures to take <laughs> and ignore the discomfort or you know that just just some of the basic stuff like that is is yeah. you know uh being grateful for any 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 food or liquid anyone puts in front of you uh it's it's sometimes it's sometimes it's the basics to get people down but if you just just can keep yourself fed and watered and reasonably kind of sane as you go and also just 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 being able sometimes i mean in syria I mean, weeks hiding in a room not being able to go out not being able to do a thing until the coast is clear and then move to the next possibly safe place if it is indeed safe but it's a lot of patience mm -hmm. yeah. yeah no i mean that and that that sort of that's certainly something that you don't see or understand when you watch a news report is just how much hidden uh, life contortions went on to, to risk to get to that to point where you can put together a two or three minute story. Um, I've got so many more questions and stuff to talk about, but we're kind of running to the end of our allotted time. Um, so I should probably invite Leslie back in to uh, ask any questions she might have. Um, and to um, lead us to the next yeah. thing. I do feel we could go on and on here. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed we could. I, I have the same feeling and I'm also full of, uh, of, of questions and admiration, really. Uh, I, I think what Greg just said about, this is such a rare and precious reminder for those of us who are not in the world of journalism to be reminded of what it takes to bring, bring the news. And not to sound uh, too pat, but just what an incredible sort of debt in a way we all owe to people like you who are willing to risk your lives to tell us these important stories. So it was, um, I think, a beautiful way that you guys set up this conversation about Kabul originally. Uh, I think many of the viewers have never seen an image of Kabul before the Taliban conquest. Uh, so to see sort of normal life and then to ride in with you, <laughs> Fred, and to be so, have such an intimate uh, view of what it was to be embedded in that, those first moments. That's incredible what you guys brought us today. So thank you so much for that. And um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, there's there's so much more we could talk about. Uh, I I wish you all the best as you head off on your next uh, trip, and uh, hope that it will be much less violence than, than some of this. <laughs> yes, I don't want this to happen in Michigan. <laughs> yeah, you never know, but uh, I, I hope that no. you no. be safe from both the uh, the crazies and the co and COVID. So please take care of yourself as you travel. Well, um, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I want to also thank you, Greg, so much for this today and also for bringing all your uh, colleagues to us over the course of this series. Uh, it's been an amazing four weeks. Uh, thank you very, very much. No, thank you. It's been great to use this as a platform to reconnect with, with uh, people and certainly great to catch up with Fred and uh, get to share some of, some of what he, he knows. So you guys be really be safe, <laughs> and uh, well, thank you both. It's, it's been it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you, and to the audience, uh, please stay tuned for future notices about uh, our next Sala off script series. So goodbye to everyone. Thank you so goodbye, Fred. Goodbye, Fred. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Dun, dun, dun.
ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ